Well, here we're going to talk a little bit about uh, seismic attributes, just a general introduction, and I'm going to use this uh, this quote out of uh, Liner et al.'s 2004 paper. This was an SEG expanded abstract uh, from the Denver 2004 International Society of Exploration Geophysics meeting, and they note that some attributes have a solid basis in physics or ma mathematics, and we can term these general attributes. They are robust and can be expected to perform predictably from basin to basin around the world. So that just means they, they're defining, uh, they have a solid basis in physics or mathematics. And, and so you're, you're looking at some specific property of your data set. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, it might uh, depend on the geology. So you'll, you'll, you'll see here a qualification. Um, these attributes could be rendered useless by an inappropriate geologic setting, and I'm not sure what that would be. Probably uh, volcanics, uh, perhaps. You might have trouble using uh, attributes in a volcanic uh, uh, imaging. And, you know, of course, they note that uh, seismic attributes, pretty much like any seismic uh, property, that can be uh, rendered useless by random noise, uh, random or coherent noise. So. That's something that we've already seen, talking about statics and uh, normal move-out corrections, and so on. So the general attributes uh, include things I think that you're familiar with, the peak amplitude, time structure. If you've worked with seismic data, you've probably mapped uh, time structure, complex amplitude, and uh, frequency, the generalized Hilbert attributes. We'll, we'll talk about those. Uh, horizon depth, azimuth, illumination, and so on and so forth. We, we have a whole uh, playlist on AVO. We spent a good bit of time with that. Uh, edge detection is good for fracture mapping, fault detection, uh, coherence, spectral decomposition. I hope uh, we'll include uh, a, a, few, um, a few videos on uh, spectral analysis and talk a little bit more about spectral decomposition. This, this can be a rather in-depth uh, topic in itself, as, as a lot of these can, as you've already seen with AVO, for example. So this is another paper by Chen and Sidney, uh, 1997. And this is in the interpreter's corner of um, uh, the leading edge. And uh, they overwhelm us, basically, with um, the, you know, a great number of attributes that uh, have become, I wouldn't say common, but that have been developed over the years. This has been a focus of a lot of people's research, and they are continually kind of tweaking uh, uh, one seismic attribute into another. And so we have uh, seismic attributes. We're looking here at, uh, from Chen and Sydney, you know, they've grouped them into uh, two categories. This is a wave kinematic uh, dynamics attributes. You can see that we have attributes for amplitude, wave shape, frequency, attenuation phase, correlation energy, ratios, and I think up here you can probably barely read it, instantaneous uh, amplitude, I think, instantaneous frequency, instantaneous phase, and uh, slope of instantaneous frequency. So there are just, you know, there are probably about 100 attributes right there for uh, wave kinematics and dynamics. and Reservoir features, you could be talking about, uh, you know, amplitudes, um, uh, bright spot detection, unconformities, oil and gas bearing anomalies, uh, instantaneous phase, instantaneous frequency. You'll see some common attributes in here. Uh, thin layer reservoirs, uh, you know, we get into spectral decomposition there, differentiable uh, plastic from uh, limestone reservoirs, structural discontinuity, lithologic. So you can see just uh, <clears throat> just a great number of uh, attributes, and, and it's almost endless. I, I think there are over 200 maybe in this paper that that uh, that have been listed, and these aren't ones that you would see, you know, day to day. But a lot of people spend their careers looking uh, at attributes, tweaking them, and developing new ones. And and this is all pretty alluring to the interpreter because a lot of these attributes are built into the software, so with the click of a button, and we'll show you that in a minute, you can generate attributes and uh, have a look at uh, the attributes throughout your uh, 
seismic data volume. So they do give you different views of your data, and sometimes they are, uncover things that uh, you're looking for. And that's why people usually use attributes is to uncover some specific piece of information that they're interested in, they're trying to find structural discontinuity, stratigraphic discontinuities, uh, oil and gas bearing uh, an anomalies, and, and, uh, and so on. So there's usually a specific purpose in mind. Uh, the attribute rendering is done in uh, just a 2D, uh, 2D windows. You can uh, calculate your traditional uh, instantaneous seismic attributes. You can take a horizon uh, view out along a, an interpreted horizon. Uh, you can take a time slice view, just cut right through the, uh, <clears throat> the data. And then you can just calculate attributes throughout your entire 3D seismic volume, and there are different uh, different approaches that you might take for doing that. You could calculate uh, parameters uh, out along an inline direction, a cross line directional, a direction, a left diagonal, right diagonal, triangular. You could extend the number of samples out in, uh, in either direction for this calculation. Uh, inlines and cross lines, the diagonals uh, combined. Uh, if we were if we didn't, if strike didn't lie along an in-line or cross-line direction, we might have to do some kind of a interpolation um, scheme between traces in order to come up with samples out along the strike direction. Maybe um, you know some kind of a, a Laguerre uh, uh, polynomial interpolation or something like that. But this is this is what's going on inside of a 3D volume, and of course that goes um, that goes up and down vertically within the volume as well. So, um, so this is something to uh, you know think about as you look at the attributes as you as you generate them. And of course, these general attributes, um, <clears throat> complex um, complex amplitude and frequency. And we'll talk about the Hilbert attributes, uh, horizon dip, azimuth, and so on. Uh, these are the ones that we'll talk a little bit about. We've already, as I mentioned, we've. We've got uh, several videos on ABO, and, and we do need to spend some time on um, spectral analysis and talk a little bit about this in, in some more detail. So I think a spectral decomposition is a particularly useful uh, uh, approach to, to you, you can do spectral blending, and um, so it's so a very useful uh, technique uh, to, to work with. If you haven't, and I, you know, I'd certainly encourage you uh, to become a student member of the Society of Exploration Geophysics. Um, these, um, uh, the, the, the annual dues are very reasonable, anywhere from 26 to $6, depending on your location uh, on the planet. And you should just be able to type in seg.org uh, to, to get to the uh, SEG site. Um, the student membership gives you access to the leading edge, uh, the SEG library, and so you can get basically any article that, that I refer to and you know, most of these lectures. Uh, you can get uh, uh, reduced uh, admission fees to the uh, uh, international exposition annual meetings, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that would also apply to the regional meetings, uh, scholarship opportunities, uh, uh, workshops. Um, there are student chapters probably in your area that you know know something about already, maybe. So I definitely encourage you to do this. Uh, the annual meetings are just a wonderful experience, and you'll learn so much there just uh, talking with uh, other people, listening to papers. And I find it particularly interesting and kind of end up spending most of my time in the uh, exposition uh, exposition halls. So uh, <clears throat> but the companies come in and demonstrate the, the latest developments. So, so really consider this. It's, it's well worth the $26 to, to $6. And, uh, so what we want to do now is um, take a look at some uh, seismic data volume here in Petrel. And, and so I've uh, brought up a, a 3D seismic volume here in Petrel. Uh, let me, this is a post hoc time migrated volume. Let me turn on a cross line here and uh, just kind of rotate things around 
little bit. I, ha I have a significant vertical exaggeration in here, but we're looking at uh, this is the Marcellus shale. You can see some listeric uh, uh, faults uh, dip, dipping back in this direction over here. Uh, turn this turn this line off again. You can see one, two, three, four faults there. Uh, they don't appear to be rooted in the deeper section, but um, if we turn off the cross lines and look at the structure, we can see we can see these uh, structural features go all the way down into the deeper, almost to the basement. Uh, fault there, fault there, fault there, so on and so forth. So this is um, this is the Mar Marcellus. Let me just turn on a um, let me turn on the top of the shale interval and the base of the shale interval here and just uh, I won't make too much of a difference but let's just zoom in and uh, uh, take a take a look at um, uh, take a look at kind of a close-up look at the response of the uh, the Marcellus of course would be in the lower part of this right on top of the Onondaga limestone so so this is a um, a typical uh, 3D seismic volume, and these surfaces have been uh, interpreted from uh, the, uh, the 3D seismic. So I hope to to do a more comprehensive or run a more comprehensive course uh, or set of videos on uh, the um, organic uh, shale and interpretation, but uh, hope to do that down the road and uh, probably would probably use this probably use this particular volume but right now just remember that this is the um, uh, black shale interval I'll turn off this cross line again and I've already done the calculations but <clears throat> from a seismic interpretation window we have this uh, volume attributes and uh, let's just pull this up for a minute um, and see what's available for us. Um, <clears throat> we have several categories of uh, attributes, signal processing, uh, amplitude of course, spectral decomposition, uh, median filter, RMS amplitude, uh, gains, uh, AGC, automatic gain control, so on. Um, and, and we are going to spend some time talking about the uh, complex trace attributes and uh, instantaneous uh, frequency phase, um, uh, quadrature amplitude, um, envelope, and, and so on. So, but you'll see that if you think back to that uh, paper by Chen and Sidney, uh, a lot of those attributes, uh, basic attributes here, um, you can see so many of them here along the list. Um, so there's a lot to choose from, and uh, what I'm just going to pull up real briefly, I've already uh, calculated, uh, would be the um, uh, just the uh, instant, instantaneous frequency and the quadrature amplitude. So uh, I won't. It all goes pretty quick, but I can mess things up pretty quickly as well. So I already have these um, these volumes. Uh, up down here. So if we look at the uh, quadrature amplitude uh, and we turn on a, an inline, and this may be difficult to this may be difficult to see, um, but I, I think if you look at this red cycle here, and as I move this back, you'll see that it turns into a blue cycle. So. So when we're calculating the quadrature, we've got basically a 90 degree, 90 degrees phase shift in the uh, from our original original data, and that's what the Hilbert transform gives you. It gives you kind of a 90 degree phase shift. We'll we'll basically do this by just by exchanging the real and imaginary parts, and then here let's take a look at the um, instantaneous um, uh, frequency. And um, here, let's see if we can see if we can do this. Um, pull in on a particular feature, but let's take a look at. And we can see that the frequencies in here are pretty high. 
and that's kind of what we see here. We have a frequency a scale bar over here. Uh, we can see that this is higher frequency, this is lower frequency. That, and we get the really high frequency here is about 75 hertz. So pull that, uh, pull that back again. And so we've got some high frequencies in here, some really low frequencies in here, and then we have some uh, 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 intermediate frequencies there. So, so this is uh, this is just an example of some of the complex trace attributes that uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that I, you know, I think probably most of you have seen before. Um, and we're using a, we're using a, a volume here from the uh, that, that, that shows the uh, Marcellus uh, shale response. I think I actually kind of went up a little bit. The Marcellus shale would be down here. But the point was just to sh show you that the uh, quadrature basically pulls the signal about 90 degrees out of phase. Of course, you're looking at uh, several frequency components. The instantaneous frequency um, tells you kind of what what kinds of frequencies dominate different uh, areas in your data set. So that was just a quick quick look at some data and um, we'll do a little bit more with that. We'll, we, we used Petrel then, we'll come back and we'll use uh, Kingdom Suite uh, as well. Uh, but uh, we're also, as I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, complex trace attributes and uh, talk about this paper by Tanner, Kohler, and Sheriff. Uh, but actually, I, you know, I think uh, the first time I recall seeing it, where I think there's a good introductory discussion, not too in-depth, is in uh, Memoir 26, AAPG Memoir 26, and uh, on seismic stratigraphy. And I think if you pull out AAPG Memoir 26 and look through it, you'll see so many things that you probably see bits and pieces of in a lot of the papers that you, you may have read in geophysics. And it's a, a good uh, comprehensive uh, text, and a lot of people just use these ideas over and over and over again. And the memoirs used to be, they came out infrequently, so, so this, was, this was quite a compilation and uh, uh, well worth the time to take a look through uh, that. Uh, again, not specifically this paper, because we're in this paper, uh, it, they document, uh, you know, just exactly how you go about taking the Hilbert transform. But uh, that I need to give you a link to that uh, AAPG memoir 26. But uh, real quickly, just the um, we're we're thinking of the um, trace that you normally see in seismic data as this real trace, but it it would also have a quadrature component. And uh, the problem is to find out what this quadrature component is. And, we think of this a real part as a cosine term. F of t is like some a cosine omega t plus theta. And we think of this complex conjugate as just a, a phase shifted um, um, sine term, so 90 degrees phase shift. So uh, the quadrature uh, component um, can be determined from f of t. And the way we're going to do this is, uh, well, we use the Hilbert transform in the time domain and do a convolution. But we'll also just exchange the um, real and imaginary values in a Fourier transform in order to come up with this uh, uh, quadrature trace. So a um, little bit long on this one, but the next time we'll, uh, uh, we, we may take a look at uh, some of the attribute display attributes in Kingdom Suite, but um, either uh, next time or uh, uh, the following, we'll talk about the uh, calculation of the quadrature uh, trace and we'll look specifically at the, uh, we'll, we'll apply this idea to the, uh, just calculating the quadrature of the cosine, make it, make it real simple. Obviously if we take the quadrature of the cosine we should get the sine. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for uh, joining me and we'll uh, see you next time.